you are freer than you think. It's like the ultimate form of freedom. You expound upon that freedom to develop on this planet. True freedom comes from within. It's the ability. Thinking to myself, I can help you or I can destroy you. Man is a two-time felon. I work really hard and I've been a, I've been a life learner. When things are feeling tough, let yourself be surprised. The world favors risk-taking. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the Freedom Pact. Hey, hey. Welcome back, my Freedom Pact family. Welcome back to episode 85. And what a phenomenal episode this one is going to be. Before we delve straight into it, I want to give you guys an apology. As you will have seen, we've been pretty slow on content for these last six weeks. There were a few things which just didn't go to plan. We made the decision that if the content doesn't meet the requirements and the standards that we've set for the show, then we're not just going to release content for the sake of it. This was unfortunate, but we want to stick by ourselves and we want to only release content which is going to bring you guys value. So I'm not going to go too much into this because I could get myself into trouble. But nonetheless, we have got weeks and weeks and weeks of recorded content. We've got the biggest guest we've ever, ever connected with booked in now for these next couple of weeks. So it's going to be back to business as normal. Today on the show, we are joined by Dr. Jonah Berger. Jonah is a marketing professor at the highly prestigious Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD from Stanford University. As well as this, Joan is a three times best-selling author of books that you will know, such as the smash hit book Contagious, Invisible Influence, and his latest piece, The Catalyst, How to Change Anybody's Mind. Joan has consulted for Nike, Apple, the Gates Foundation, and is a world-renowned expert on change and influence. Today we are discussing the results of Jonah's research into influence. We look at how we can change someone else's mind. Perhaps it's a spouse's, perhaps it's a boss, a peer group, an organization, your industry, your client, your customer, whoever this could be. Jonah has found five hidden factors through his research that impede change. He's broken this down into a framework that he calls Reduce. And we look at this and the new psychology of influence. I hope you enjoy getting this podcast back to normal and this hugely impressive episode with Dr. Jonah Berger. Jonah Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. What breakthroughs have we made since Cialdini wrote Influence to the contemporary subject of influence today? What do we know now? Yeah, I mean, what I'd start by saying is, is Cialdini's book is a, is a wonderful book. Um, uh, and it's, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, an early Bible uh, of, of influence uh, and research on influence. Um, but what I would say about that book, is, as well as any books uh, that, are, that are that old, um, you know, hopefully we've learned a little bit since that book uh, came out. Um, that book obviously shares a number of important principles that are really valuable uh, to, to understanding human behavior. Uh, but we've learned a little bit uh, since then. So, you know, take, um, let's say, the difference between uh, my most recent book, The Catalyst, and and Influence. Um, You know, I think often uh, when we try to change minds, uh, we try to do some version of pushing. Uh, We think if we add more reasons, more facts, more figures, um, you know, if we just explain to people why we think something is is the right thing to do, uh, they'll come around. Um, And it makes a lot of sense why we think that way, right? If if you think about the physical world, think about a chair, for example. Uh, If we want to move a chair, pushing the chair.
chair is often a great way to do it. We want to get that chair to go in a particular direction. We push it in that direction uh, and it goes. But there's one problem when we apply that uh, same notion to people, which is when we push people, they don't just go, uh, they often push back, right? When we try to get people to move in a particular direction, they often react or push back against our, 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 our pushing uh, and do, do the exact opposite. And so the, the question of, of my most recent book, The Catalyst, is really, well, if pushing doesn't work, what, what does, right? Could there be a better approach to changing minds uh, and driving action? Uh, and if so, what is that approach and how do we apply it? So I've worked in sales. I've done everything from cold calling to closing to prospecting. And in all the areas that I've worked in, Jonah, there's always been what I would call a more framework. I've had managers that have told me, if you want to make more sales, then make more calls, send more emails, do more follow-ups, play the numbers game. It's always more, more, more. You are reduce framework takes a different approach to this in the sense that you don't advise to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. You don't advise to just keep pushing that prospect over and over and over. That framework is almost backing someone into a corner, right? So how long do you think it would take for that push-in sales culture to change to this reduce model, which seems to be more effective? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends uh, a little bit uh, on your goals, uh, and I think uh, part of it is also, um, you know, the 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 future catching up uh, and changing the past. Um, you know, just because we have done things a certain way doesn't mean that way works. Um, and as we see, whether it's disruption in business models or industries or whatever it, it may be, um, often new approaches come along that work better and and get adopted. Um, and I think that's really what what this is about, right? It's, it's not about pushing harder. It's about understanding what the barriers are to change and, and how to mitigate them. I think really what good change agents do is they, is they don't say, hey, you know, what could I do to get someone to change? They say, well, why hasn't that person changed already? What's stopping or preventing them? And, and how do I mitigate those obstacles? And, and note, you know, that's different than the method you may have used uh, in the past, as you mentioned. Um, you know, understanding what the obstacles are requires understanding the person that we're trying to change. Right? It requires taking a little bit of time to understand, well, what their motivations are, what their fears are, what things they're looking for, what things they're trying to avoid. If we don't understand them, it's going to be really hard to, to change them. And so the catalyst talks all about those common barriers that come up again and again uh, and how to mitigate those common barriers. But you're right that it is a, is a new and, and different approach to change. One of the mental models which we talk about on this show and we brought Shane Parrish on, we went into this in detail. And I was just thinking about that as you were saying it to me, this has just come into my mind, is that one of the mental models which we love to use is inversion. Uh, so this comes from mathematics. So an example of this would be instead of saying, how can I be happy? You sort of flip it and you say, okay, how can I be unhappy? And then you think, okay, if I was to be unhappy, I would take a meaningless job, I'd disrupt my sleep, I'd start eating loads of processed foods, I wouldn't work out, I would getting myself involved in toxic relationships and whatnot. So I wonder if I could flip that to you in the context of the catalyst. And what would the inversion <laughs> of uh, the premise of the book be? I, I love that example and I, and I love that approach. Uh, and I think even as you were talking, right, you're illuminating what the things not to do are by looking at the opposite. And, and that's sort of what happened to me as well. So, you know, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm an academic. I have a PhD from the Stanford Graduate School of Business uh, in, in marketing, but at, at the core, I'm a, I'm a social psychologist. So I publish about half my research in psychology, half my research in marketing. Um, uh, in 2013, I came out with my first sort of popular press book uh, called Contagious. It was all about word of mouth and why things catch on. And it sort of changed things for me. So I used to, you know, spend about 95% of my time doing research and teaching. Uh, since that book came out, I've had the opportunity to work with a variety of clients, everything from big organizations like, you know, the Googles and the Nikes and the Apples of the world, uh, to small startups, for-profits and non-profits, B2B and B2C companies. Um, and again and again, I started noticing that, hey, the traditional ways of doing things, the traditional ways of pushing weren't, weren't working. And so I, I kind of started wondering, well, could 
there be a, a different or or better way? I started looking at academic research um, and some of both the old work and new work that's being done. I started interviewing people, you know, everything from folks we might expect, like great salespeople and great leaders and sort of, uh, you know, folks in the business world, but also folks like hostage negotiators, uh, people like, um, you know, substance abuse counselors, parenting uh, advisors, um, you know, anyone who's trying to change someone's mind uh, in some sort of context. And I started to sort of look for patterns, things that came up again and again. Um, and so really part of what the book is, is kind of identifying approaches, what the core underlying science is of how those approaches work and, and how to apply them. Whether that application is you want to change a spouse's mind, whether that application is you want to change a boss's mind, uh, whether it's you want to change a customer or, or client's mind. But I think by identifying what's not working and why those things are not working, we can be much better, as you said, in, in solving our, our problems. Let's look at the title of uh, the book, The Catalyst. When I read that, it took me back to my GCSE chemistry days, my high school chemistry days. So how come you named the book The Catalyst? So as you said, uh, it relates a bit to chemistry. Um, and as we think about sort of change being hard, change is obviously hard in the social world. It's even harder in chemistry. Uh, it often takes, uh, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of years for plant matter to, you know, turn into oil or, you know, carbon to be uh, slowly pressed uh, into diamonds. Uh, so chemists often add temperature and pressure uh, to make change happen faster. Um, you think about a kernel of popcorn, for example, to get it to pop, you got to put it in the microwave. It adds temperature. Uh, and that kernel pops. Same thing in chemistry. We add temperature, we add pressure, uh, things change. But there are a special set of substances uh, in chemistry that uh, chemists often use to make change happen faster and easier. Uh, they do everything, these substances, from clean the grime on your contact lenses to clean the engine uh, in your car. Um, but most interesting is the way that these substances work. Uh, they don't increase the temperature, they don't increase the pressure, they actually lower the amount of energy required for change. You might say, well, how is that possible? That seems to go against the very laws of, of thermodynamics. But what, what they do is they create an alternate path, right? They figure out what those barriers are, and in some sense, they mitigate them. And these substances, as you alluded to, are called catalysts. And so I love that analogy. We often use in the, in the social world, we call someone a catalyst if they create change. Uh, but I love this broader point. It's not just the catalyst create change, it's how they create uh, that change. They don't add temperature. They don't add pressure. They don't, uh, you know, step on the gas pedal. Pedal. They figure out what those barriers are and sort of prevent those barriers uh, from from driving uh, driving change not to happen. So when we're talking about influence and these ideas which you've come up with, Jonah, I suppose what really fascinates me about influence is how it's gained. I found that influence is actually gained in a counterintuitive way. We often think that to gain influence, we need to be our most charismatic self. We need to show off with our achievements, with our success, with our products and ideas. We try to gain influence by painting ourselves in the best light. I mean, how often have we tried to get a boss or a partner to like us by just telling them how great we are? But what I've learned, and what social science has largely points to, is that we gain influence not by painting ourselves in the best light but by pointing that spotlight on others people love to talk about themselves dale carnegie spotted this and he wrote about this in the 1930s in how to win friends and influence people if you want to be the most interesting person in the room be the most interested in social circles it's about people centricity and in business terms it's about customer centricity I, you you nailed it i mean uh you know uh people in, in marketing talk a lot about customer centricity but i think that same idea is true more broadly right whether that person that customer is your boss they're not technically a customer but they're the customer that you want to change whether that quote-unquote customer is your spouse whether it's it's your child the more you understand them and why they haven't done what you want the more likely you can get them to come around i was, I was talking to a hostage negotiator who told me this amazing story um you know he said you know hey you know when hostage negotiators start out um often uh they focus on the change they want to happen they say look you know i want the suspect to come out with their hands up i want the person not to commit suicide and so I I jump right to that. I jump right to the change I want to happen. I tell the person to do or not to do what I want them to do, and I hope that will work. But what great negotiators do, what, what experienced negotiators start doing, is they start with the person, 
that they're trying to change. So they don't start with influence because that never works, right? It doesn't work to influence right away. You have to build trust. You have to build empathy. You have to build understanding. You have to be inside someone's frame for them to even listen to you. Um, and so just like you mentioned, those sales calls don't work when you just sort of bombard people with information. They don't have a relationship with you. Start by building that relationship. The more you understand about them, the more you can get to a solution that will work. I'll, I'll tell a story. It's a little bit of a, it's not a, it's not a cheery story, but I think it's a very illustrative story. He told me this story that um, uh, he was dealing with uh, where he was called in and a gentleman wanted to commit suicide. And so obviously this is a solution uh, or situation we, we hope we will never be in and, and one that is uh, much more drastic than the changes most of us are trying to achieve. Uh, but he was called in. There was a, a, a guy who was trying to commit suicide um, and he was wanting to commit suicide because he had lost his job. Um, he didn't have any money. He wanted to provide for his family but didn't know how to provide for his family. He didn't have any options. And so he thought, hey, if I kill myself, um, you know, this insurance policy will pay out uh, and my family will be, I'll be safe. Uh, and so what's complicated there, though, is the truth is that if the guy kills himself, the insurance policy won't pay because it has a clause in it saying, hey, if you know suicide, we don't pay upon suicide. But you come in there, barely and say, don't commit suicide. Here's why. You tell the person that. They're a bit emotional at the moment, right? They might do something that you don't want them to do. And so instead, the negotiator doesn't start with that. He comes and says, hey, I'm Greg. How are you doing? He starts by asking a question, open-ended question. How are you doing? What do you need? How are you feeling? How can I help you? He starts by building that, that connection. He starts by building a relationship, right? And he begins to understand why that guy is there in the first place. He says, well, you know, why do you want to commit suicide? And the guy says, oh, you know, my family, I lost my job, X, Y, Z, and so on. And he says, oh, you seem to care a lot about your family. You know, tell me a little bit more about them. He says, oh, I have two young boys. And so he says, oh, tell me about your boys. And so he says how, you know, their ages and their names. And he wants them to grow up to be great young men men and you know, treat women with respect and uh, care about learning and all these different things. And you know, at one point, Greg is listening to this, this conversation and he goes, oh, you know, it sounds like you care a lot about your boys. And the guy goes, yeah, I do. And Greg goes, well, if you kill yourself today, your sons will lose the best friend they've ever had. And notice what he really cleverly did. Right? It didn't happen from minute zero. It took a while to build that relationship, to build that trust, to build that understanding. But by building that understanding, as you nicely said, by being customer-centric, by understanding why that guy was there in the first place, he helped the guy realize, wait a second, right? actually, this is not the best way to get what I want. Because what I really want is to be there for my kids, right? And so doing what I thought I was going to do before is not the best solution to get there. But you can't get there. You can't get to that result, right? You can't show that person that what you want is actually the best way for them to get where they're going without understanding them deeply. And so I think starting with that understanding will help get to a better solution. One of the key lessons from that story is a powerful lesson in psychology, right? That people love to buy, but they hate they hate to be sold. As humans, as you've mentioned, we have an anti-persuasion radar. And as soon as we feel someone is trying to influence us, then we immediately put a guard up. I've learned this the hard way in business, in friendships, in relationships. And I think that this goes back to the key point of your idea. And that is that we have a tendency to think that the key to influence someone else is to say, look, this is what we're doing and I'm going to keep pushing you until you do it. But in reality, this couldn't be further from the truth. There is an art to letting other people have your way. And one of the main things that I think that we need to avoid when we're trying to influence someone else is telling someone what they should want what they should think, what they should feel. We should never, ever, ever tell someone what they should want, think, or feel. And I would go one step further and say that, look, we should never argue with someone that we are trying to influence, ever. As soon as you do that, it is game over. Their anti-persuasion radar will kick straight in, and that person will instantly become more defensive. As soon as that pride kicks in, the battle has been lost. The key to influence, what I found, is that you need to ask questions and to find out what the other person needs, what they want, what they desire, and skillfully ask questions to potentially offer another way of doing things. 
in the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, which I'm sure many of you have seen, there's that great example where uh, Jordan Belfort, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, asks one of the guys to sell him this pen. And I know that this has become a common question in sales interviews. Sell me this pen. The rookie salesman, the amateur, will immediately start telling someone how great that pen is. In that situation, the only thing that you can do, or a master salesman would do, would be to flip her and say, look, are you in the market for a pen? (laughs) So that's the key thing to influence, is to ask questions, to find out the other person's needs, wants, where they are. And in regards to that story, one of the notes I've got by you, Joan, is that I love how Greg immediately personalised himself. I remember in Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, he went a step further and said that someone's own name is the sweetest word in the dictionary. Bill Clinton was a master of this. He had one of his assistants digitalize a word document for him with tens of thousands of names of people he had met, where they were from, what they did, what they looked like, what they discussed. Clinton was a master influencer and a master of personalization. So how important, Jonah, do you think that that personal touch really is? I think certainly personalizing the relationship is helpful. Mm. Um, you know, now you know that person's name, you know who they are. There's an appendix to the book where I talk a lot about some of the different approaches hostage issues use. Everything from, you know, pronouns, right? It's not I and you, it's we. You know, if we're going to get out of this together, we need to figure out how to solve whatever. It, it starts, hey, you know, you and I aren't separate. We're a team. Everything from the language we use, the questions we ask, as you said, a- asking you know, or using your name at the beginning of that thing, all of those provide those subtle cues that build that connection that, that make the outcome more likely. I think that this is a great part of the conversation to dive into your research and these five barriers that you have found that inhibit influence starting with reactinence which is the start of your reduce model but i'd just like to round off what you just said by there by linking it to episode 72 that we did with daniel coyle in the interview that we did with coyle he alluded to research that he found where he said that we are always seeking out what he calls belonging cues These belonging cues are hardwired into our DNA to know whether or not we belong in an environment. In the caveman era, this was one of the main tools in which that they had to keep them safe. So a simple example of this is a genuine smile or welcoming body language. As we know, we have mirror neurons in our minds, so we're highly susceptible to the moods and the feelings of others. On a much deeper level and really prevalent to this conversation, people have a real deep desire to feel accepted and loved for who they are. And I think that influence comes over others much more from accepting other people and being curious to their position than it is from pushing and pushing and pushing them to say yes. If I want to influence you, then I need to give you the power to influence me. And I do this by asking you what your thoughts are, what your needs are. I want to find out how you're feeling. The typical manager leads by authority, by seeking power, whereas a great leader will lead by empowering you. I love that saying in which it says, leaders don't create followers, they create other leaders. As you mentioned, the faster that I can change the dynamic from one of distance to one of belonging and togetherness, from you and I to us and we, then the faster that we gain the ability to influence. There is so, so much great social science done in this field, which applies to relationships, to leadership, to business. And it's all done by finding core underlying principles which are transferable, right? I think when social science does a good job, it finds something fundamental 
I think that's the first step, finding something fundamental and then helping people address that something. Um, and so that's really what I've tried to do in this book. You know, some of this book is my own research, but a lot of it is just the amazing work that people have done uh, in different areas. You know, um, I know we'll get to the framework in a second, but, you know, the idea of reactants, the first main barrier that I talk about, reactants happens to kids when you're trying to get them dressed in the morning. Reactance happens to teenagers when you tell them to quit smoking. Reactance happens to your boss when you try to, you know, push them on a particular project that you think they should work on. That principle of reactance is a fundamental psychological phenomenon. And the better we understand that fundamental underlying psychology, the smarter and, and more better off we're going to be. Yeah, that sounds great. So the underlying question behind the book is, if pushing doesn't work, could there be a different and a better way? So you just mentioned the first underlying principle of the book. So we've got five reactants, endowment, distance, uncertainty, and then corroborating evidence. So that neatly spells out reduce, which I'm sure is no <laughs> no accident. So could we just get a short, uh, short speaker bio for each one, and then we can just delve into a couple? Sure, yeah. So um, uh, let's start with reactants. Uh, and so the idea of reactants is... Um, a simple notion that I think many of your listeners may have experienced in, in one way or another. Uh, but the basic idea is people like to have freedom and control. They like to feel like the choices they make, the actions they take, the things they do are because they want to do them. They are in the driver's seat. They are in the driver's seat of their own life. Um, but the challenge is that when we influence someone, we try to influence someone, we try to persuade them, we try to change their mind, we got to get them to take a certain action, we impinge on their ability to see that choice or that action as driven by themselves. Right? If I'm asking someone to do something, now they're not sure if they're doing that thing because they wanted to do it or whether I asked them to do it. And so as a result, they push back. They feel uncomfortable. They have this feeling of reactance, and, and they push back. Essentially, people have almost an anti-persuasion radar. Uh, you can think about it like an anti-missile defense system or, or almost like a spidey sense that goes off when they feel like someone's trying to persuade them. So when they get a sales call, for example, when an email comes in that tries to persuade them, when an ad comes on the television, they engage in a bunch of countermeasures to uh, you know, protect themselves. Uh, one of those countermeasures is to avoid uh, in the first place, right? So an ad comes on, you walk out of the room. Another is to ignore it, right? Maybe you can't walk out of the room, but you start doing something else. Uh, or even worse, right? If we can't ignore it or we can't avoid it, uh, we counter-argue. Uh, we sit there thinking about all the reasons why uh, what, what that person suggested uh, is wrong. Rather than just listening, we start poking holes uh, in, in their argument. Uh, and so one question then is, okay, if pushing people doesn't work, if we try to persuade people or get them to do something, they push back, what, what does? And so really what this chapter uh, is all about, the solutions are about, is, is how can we allow for agency? How can we make people feel like they have freedom and control uh, over, over their lives? And so, um, you know, in the book, I talk about four solutions. Uh, I'll give you just one, and then I'll pause and see if you, you know, would like more or, or have other questions. But, you know, one uh, is what I call guided choices. Uh, and to give you a sense of what I mean, uh, you know, you're, imagine you're at the office uh, and you're presenting something to your colleagues. Uh, you're saying, hey, we should start a new program or this is a new initiative or this is the way I think we should do things, right? You're sitting there making your presentation. But as we talked about, your colleagues are probably sitting there thinking about all the reasons why they don't like what you're saying. Oh, it'll be too expensive. Oh, it won't work. Oh, we can't integrate it with what we're doing already. Same thing for a consultant, right? You're a consultant. You're trying to sell a project uh, to someone. They're thinking about all the reasons why your solution won't necessarily work. Uh, and so what great catalysts, great change agents do is they don't just give people one option. They give them multiple. They present at least two or three options. And, and notice what that does. Right? When you give people one option, they sit there, they think about the reasons why they don't like what you suggested. So uh, in a spouse example, you know, your spouse says, hey, what do you want to do this weekend? You say, let's go to the movies. They say, oh, I don't feel like that. You know, we went to the movies last weekend, or it's so nice outside. You know, maybe we should do something else. But if you give people two or three options, now they have a different job. Now, rather than thinking about what they don't like about what you suggested, they're thinking about which of the options you suggested they like better. And because they're focusing on which ones they like better, they're much more likely to choose one at the end of that situation. 
Notice it's choice. You're giving them freedom and autonomy, but it's guided choice. You're not giving them 30 choices or 50 choices or 75 choices. You're giving them two, three, maybe even four options and allowing them to choose from that self-described choice set. Parents even do this with their kids, right? I sort of alluded to this earlier, but you know, I have a two and a half year old. Uh, when you're trying to get your kids dressed in the morning or get them to eat dinner or whatever it might be, they often say, no, they don't want to do it. Uh, so what parenting experts often talk about is, well, give them a choice, right? Do you want to put on your shirt first or your pants? Do you want to eat your broccoli first or do you want to eat your chicken first, right? Now your kid's sitting there going, hmm, which one do I want to do first? And rather than think about how they don't want to do with what you're suggesting, they're focused on their choice, right? Give them that choice, they're much more likely to buy in. So let's see if I've understood what you've just said. So if I offer someone one choice, they are going to be coming up with a long list of reasons in their mind as to why this is a bad idea. If I give them two or three choices, then they're going to stop considering whether it's a good or bad decision and start considering which of the two or three available to them is the best option. So, for example, if I'm selling popcorn on the street corner, if I only offer one size of popcorn, then it becomes a simple decision to the person that walks by. Do I want the popcorn, yes or no? If I have three sizes of popcorn available, say a small, medium, and large, then the decision then changes from, do I want the popcorn, to the decision of, which of the available sizes of popcorn do I want? Am I right in saying that? That is my interpretation. That, that's exactly right. And so the other solutions are, are based on that same idea. How can we get people to participate? Right? How can we make them feel like they have a say in, in what's going on? Uh, another sort of strategy I talk about is asking rather than telling. Right? You know, often when we tell people what to do, they, they push back. So you know, think about the moment with the coronavirus, right? And um, you know, they're saying, stay indoors, don't do this, you know, don't do that. And everyone's saying, don't tell me what to do. You know, uh, I'll do whatever I want. They're in the U.S., I don't know if this has made this all the way to you, but there was a guy who was arrested for licking things in Walmart. Yeah. You know, why was he licking things in Walmart? Well, part of the reason was because he thought that he wasn't supposed to do that. And so he said, well, screw you. I'm going to do whatever, whatever I want. And so rather than telling people, right, what to do, a better strategy is often to ask them, right? Ask them a set of questions, right? Say, you know, what do you think the uh, consequences are of going out for your health? Uh, you know, there's a boss I talked to, a great leader who was people to stay late after work which obviously no one wants to do, right? And so he's running a startup. He's trying to get people to stay late after work. And so instead of telling people to stay late, which, which no one would do, he instead goes, okay, you know, hey guys, what kind of organization do we want to be? A good company or a great company? And we know how everyone answers that question. They go, oh yeah, we want to be a great company. He says, okay, well, what do we need to, get, what do, we need to do to get there? He asks them for their opinion. Right? Now, again, rather than counter-arguing, they're thinking about what their opinion is. Uh, and then even better, though, once they suggest their opinion, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that, they've sort of put a stake in the ground. Right? And once they've said their opinion, it's going to be a lot harder for them later on when you suggest doing something like that for them not to agree to do it because they've in some sense committed to the conclusion because they came up with it rather than you because it's their idea rather than yours. They've already bought into it. And so by allowing people to participate, by allowing people to shape the, the discussion and to have a role, they're going to be much more bought in to that outcome you wanted them to get to. What I love about this is that just thinking back to my time in sales, I remember that there was a saying which used to go around that was that people hate to be sold, but they love to buy. And one of the major things which I pretty sure would relate to reactants is the principle of making people qualify themselves. Would that link into this one? What do you mean qualify themselves? Example of this I could give is that I remember we did an episode with Susan Quilliam, who is like a relationship expert or couples therapy, I believe. And she would say that on a date, she would always tell people that were dating to say to the person sitting opposite, I really like people that, say, for example, love the theatre. Do you love the theatre? And then the other person who they've just met, they'd be like, oh, uh, yeah, sure, I love the theatre. I love Matilda. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a way of sort of taking control and sort of positioning yourself as perhaps higher value. And another example, I suppose, in the sales world would be just saying, oh, okay, so it's like, what do you like about this product? So then they can start talking to you about, oh, well, actually, nice. you know, I, yeah. I really like this or that. Uh, would that I, sort of be I, like it? 
Yeah. What I love about what you just said is notice what you, you did, and, and you may have realized it, but I want to make sure your listeners realize it. You asked a question, but you didn't ask any question, right? You didn't say, uh, what don't like you like about this product? Because that's a question, right? Um, uh, you know, what's wrong with this product? You picked a question that guided the conversation in the right way. Servers often do this in, in restaurants, right? So they say, oh, you know, what did you like most about your meal today? Right, And notice what they're doing. They could have said, hey, what didn't you like about your meal? But by encouraging you to focus on the stuff that you liked, right, you're much more likely to say at the end of that meal that you like the meal and, and give them a higher tip. And so it's using questions, but it's asking the right questions to sort of uh, guide that, that thing. There's, a, there's an effect in marketing called the mere measurement effect, which is kind of, kind of shows, hey, you know, merely asking people for their opinions can in some cases uh, increase their likelihood of purchasing the same thing in the future. But in some senses, as long as their opinion are positive because it, it kind of makes them go, oh, I do like this thing. And once they've said they like that thing, well, then they're going to have to buy it again in the future. Our brain has a tendency uh, right, to completely focus on negative aspects. So, for example, one of the things which I stopped saying was that if someone, if I asked someone for a favor and they said they couldn't do it, then I, I completely stopped saying no problem because just I would always think myself that the word problem may spark may actually make them think that there is a problem <laughs> um but yeah but let's let's move on to the next one which is endowment so this is one which i really want to delve into so could you take us through this one sure yeah the idea of endowment um and and there's sort of two poles whenever change is happening right there's the past and there's the future uh the uncertainty chapter is, is all about sort of neophobia how we're scared of new things uh, and we don't change because we're scared of the new but the endowment chapter is really about the past uh, it's really about our attachment to things that we're doing already um, not only are new things scary and we may get to that if there's time but really we tend to be attached to things we're, we're doing already uh whether they're uh, we use the products that we've used in the past. We go to the same vacation destinations. We go to the same restaurants. Um, we do stuff that we're used to because we become uh, attached to them. Um, there's a, a great study research on what is called the endowment effect, where the name for the chapter comes, where it says, hey, you know, uh, let me show you this mug. And they do it with various products, tickets, mugs, anything really, but I'll, I'll talk about mugs for a second. You know, here's this nice white mug. Uh, it can hold coffee or tea or whatever beverage you like. How much would you be willing to pay for this mug? And so people look at this mug. It's not an amazing, life-changing mug. It's just a mug. And they say, oh, you know, I'll pay 2 or $3 for this mug. And that's, you know, makes sense. They pay 2 or $3 for the mug. But then for a second set of people, they say, hey, here's a mug. I'm going to give it to you. Right? Now it's your mug. Take a look at it. Hold it. Check it out. Maybe even drink some coffee or tea from it. Now, how much would you be willing to accept from someone else if they wanted to buy that mug from you? Right? So what's the lowest amount of money you'd be willing to take to give up the mug? Now, what's interesting is the valuation should be the same. That mug is the same whether you own that mug or you don't, whether you're buying it or whether you're selling it. And so the number should, again, be two or three bucks, right? Whether you're uh, buying or selling that mug, if the buyer's valued at two or three bucks, the seller should say, okay, well, if you give me two or three bucks, I'll be willing to sell the mug. But they're not. Their valuations of the mug are often two or even three times higher. It's between six and seven dollars. The mug is the same, but because it's theirs, because they're now endowed with it, because it's the thing they're already doing, it's really hard to imagine giving it giving it up. And so this is part of the reason why in the office we're so attached to the programs we're already doing, but we're unwilling to start new ones. Why we tend to vote for incumbent political candidates uh, because they're more familiar, right? Why homeowners uh, value their homes uh, sometimes uh, more above the market price the longer they've lived in the home because they become attached to it, right? Once it's yours, it becomes hard to imagine giving up. And so um, I'm happy to answer any questions about endowment itself or talk a little bit about kind of how we resolve or solve that problem. Yes. The endowment effect is a really, really interesting one. I think that this is a cognitive bias, which Daniel Kahneman, the author of uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, discovered in the early 90s and I think that the simple idea of this is that as humans we are inherently loss averse the idea of losing something causes us vast amounts of pain so I think that this is why as a marketer or as a salesperson we can use this to our advantage because the faster that you can get someone to try a sample or a demo of your product, or to set up a direct debit, the better. Because as soon as someone identifies with it, 
then the endowment effect means that they'll become more and more afraid of losing it. I think that this is why people will set up a direct debit at the gym, never cancel the direct debit, and then also never go. I read a study saying that the average American loses on average $460 per year on subscriptions to services that they don't even use. So when you think about that logically, it seems crazy, but what we don't realize is that these cognitive biases, they are really at play in our subconscious. And on another level, I'm sure we've all been in the position where a friend in a relationship that looking in from the outside, we see the relationship and we hear about it and we think that it's a terrible relationship, perhaps even extremely toxic or that they could do way, way better than that person that they're with. But what we fail to realize is that as people, we value the things which we own more than they're probably worth. And also, we combine this with a deep, deep fear of loss. Part of the challenge there is we think the status quo, what we're doing already, is safe. Right? So someone's in an abusive relationship or in a not, you know, not perfect relationship. They often say, yeah, you know, this relationship isn't perfect, but how do I know I'll meet someone better? Right? Like, yeah, this person is flawed, but they're better than, than nothing. And so we feel like that thing we're doing ready in action feels safer. It feels costless, but it's often not as costless um, as, as it might seem. Right? And so there's a, a study that I reference in the book, again, a great behavioral science study that sort of asks people, you know, which do you think causes more pain? A minor injury, uh, you know, you you you, uh, you sprain your ankle, or you know, you have uh, lower back pain, it just comes back again and again. You sprain your back and it won't go away. Uh, you know, sort of sprain your finger and it won't go away. Or a major injury, you break your injury, you break your finger, you break your back, you break your kneecap. You know, and I think the answer is pretty obvious, right? A major injury should cause you more pain. You know, yeah, it's not fun when you sprain your finger or you sprain your back and it causes you pain. But you know, God, it's much more painful uh, to break your finger or break your knee or, or break your back. But the answer is actually surprising. It turns out that minor injuries uh, cause us more pain because we never get them fixed. Right? Those major injuries, yeah, we go to the doctor and we get a cast put on and we have a rehabilitation plan and we do physical therapy and we do all those things because it's above the threshold, we get it fixed. Right? If we're in a really toxic relationship, we get out of that relationship. Right? If our house is infest, infested with cockroaches, we call an exterminator. They come, they clean the house. If we've got a couple flies, if it seems like a minor thing, we never end up getting it fixed. But because we never end up getting it fixed, over time it actually causes us more pain. And so the same idea is true more general. If we're trying to get people to let go of the past, we've got to make them realize that inaction isn't as costless as it might seem. I have a, a cousin. His name is Charles, and every time he would write an email, he would write, you know, best Charles at the bottom of the email. And I was like, Charles, you know, it's really nice of you to write the bad at the bottom of every email, but why don't you just make that part of your email signature, right? I mean, it takes you two or three seconds every time to write that at the bottom of the email. And he goes, it's only two or three seconds. Right? It's a minor injury. It's not a major one. It's, you know, a couple flies in your house. It's not worth calling an exterminator. You know, oh, it's going to take a lot of time to figure out how to write email signatures. It's just not worth it. I'm going to stick with what I'm already doing. And so I tried to get him to change his mind. He, he wouldn't do it. I tried to say, look, you know, it's it's time. We wouldn't do it. And I said, okay, well, let me let me try to take a different approach. So I said, hey, uh, how many emails do you write every day? He said, I don't know, 50 emails a day. And I said, okay, how many emails do you write every week? And he says, oh, probably 350, 400. Okay, and how many seconds does it take you for each of those emails to write that email signature? And he sits there and he starts doing the math and then he opens up Google search bar and he types in how to automate your email signature. Right? Because what that helped him do is that helped him realize that, yeah, it was a minor injury, but over time, it actually caused him a lot of pain. It highlighted the cost of inaction. It made him realize that, yes, inaction wasn't terrible, but over time, it was actually pretty bad, and so it was worth making the switch. And so that's just one of the ways to solve that problem, but make people realize that doing nothing isn't as costless uh, as, it, as it might seem. And can I just jump in there? Because what I love is that you didn't tell him you made him figure it out for himself, right? That's exactly right. And again, but notice why that's, we talked about why that's better. If you tell him, he goes, oh, don't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but it's his idea. Now, you didn't tell him to do anything. You just said, hey, let me guide you down a path that helps you realize the thing I wanted you to realize in the first place. But by picking the right questions, they're guiding it in the right way. Okay, that's great. 
So now let's look at uncertainty and the role that this plays in influence in your model. You know, uh, uncertainty is something we all uh, we all fall prey to. Uh, and I think as we've talked about a little bit already, new things are always uncertain, right? Old things might not be perfect, but with new things, you don't know, right? So will that new person that you're dating be better than the old one? I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, will a new method of doing things be faster? I don't know. Will a new product or service be better than the old one? Sure, the company says it will be better, but how do I know? And, and notice that that uncertainty stems action. Because anytime you're trying to get people to change, they're often switching costs, right? They're switching costs to getting out of an old relationship to get into a new one. They're switching costs of buying a new product and getting rid of an old one. They're switching costs of using a new service or doing anything differently. And those costs are open upfront. If you're in a relationship and you're thinking about getting into a new one, you have to break off the old relationship and do all the dating and all that work before you get to find out if there's a new person. If you're buying a new product, you have to put all the money up front to buy that product, and only then do you get to figure out if it's better. And so in some sense, there's a gap between the cost and the benefit. The cost is now, and it's certain, and the benefit is later, and it's uncertain. And so it's not surprising that most people say, well, I'm going to stick with the old thing. Because why would I be willing to pay all these upfront costs for the chance of getting something that might be better, but I don't even know if it's better? And so one question then is, well, how do we make them realize, how do we reduce that uncertainty and make them feel more comfortable with, with doing something new? And so you mentioned freemium. A great example of this is a company called Dropbox. And you're probably familiar with Dropbox, yes? Sure, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, online file storage company, uh, now it's a billion dollar business, um, but it wasn't always that way. When they, when they came out at first, um, most people were uncertain. They said, oh, look, I'm used to storing files on my computer. I've spent hours finessing this perfect Word document or taking photos of my kids. Um, and now you're asking me to store it in the cloud? I don't know where the cloud is. I've never heard of storing things in the cloud. How do I know this is going to work? And how do I know it's going to be safe? And so people were uncertain. And so Dropbox thought about, well, okay, we can buy ads, tell people how great we are. Uh, we can buy uh, search keywords. So when people type in you know, storage, we'll come up first. But what they realized is while that would increase awareness, that wouldn't solve the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem was that people were uncertain if this thing would be better. And yet Dropbox says it's better, but how do people actually know that it's better? And so Dropbox tried a slightly different approach. They gave their product away for free. They said any user uh, who wants to use up to two gigabytes uh, on Dropbox can use it for free. Now, that might be a little surprising. Uh, any kid who's ever had a lemonade stand says, you know, you can't make money giving away things for free. So how do you build a billion-dollar business giving things away for free? They didn't just give something away for free. They use this notion of freemium. And uh, what freemium is, it's a combination of two things. It's a free product and also a premium product. And so what you do is you give away a free version of something, and you encourage people to upgrade to a premium version. On Dropbox, you give away two gigabytes of storage, but if you want more storage, you have to pay for it. On Pandora, you get a version for free that has ads. You want to get rid of those ads, you got to pay for it. Uh, many uh, websites like the New York Times, for example, LinkedIn, Skype even uh, has a premium version, right? They give away some features for free, but if you want these extra features, you got to pay for them. Uh, now, it's clear why consumers like freemium, who wouldn't like to get something for free, uh, but it's really good for businesses as well. Why? Because what giving something away free does is it lowers those switching costs. It enables people to try something for less cost, less in terms of money, less in terms of effort, less in terms of time. And if they like it, then they'll convince themselves. Right? Rather than you trying to convince them, why not give that thing away and let people convince themselves, which is exactly what they did with Dropbox. People said, oh, actually, actually this is pretty good. How do I know it's pretty good? Because I've hit the two gigabyte storage limit. Well, once I hit that limit, I'm willing to pay you for it because I know how much it's value it's adding to my life because I've been using it. And so the same thing is true more generally. Yes, freemium is great, and many online businesses use freemium. Uh, but the same thing is true with taste tests. The same thing is true with uh, test drives and cars. Um, all of these things lower the barrier to trial. They don't use freemium, but what they do is they reduce the upfront cost. They allow people to experience something without having to in undergo so many uh, costs in the first place. I think even about speed dating does that for dating. Rather than having to go and find different people and try them, speed dating allows you to meet a bunch of people really quickly. It lowers the cost of figuring out whether, whether you might like someone. And by lowering the cost, it makes it more likely that one of those things uh, is going to work out. Think about test drives for cars. Right? Imagine if you walked into a car dealership and you said, hey, I'm interested in your car. And they said, okay, give me 30 dollars and then i'll let you sit in it and see if you like it no one would buy a new car 
right? Mm-hmm. They'd all stick with the old one because it was too costly to switch. And so what a test drive does is allows you to say, huh, let me see if this thing's any good. And if I like it, okay, then I'll be willing to pay for the rest of it. A, a great example, I think, you know, on a much more human level is your dog Zoe, right? I mean, you wouldn't have had the dog otherwise. Yeah, and this is I. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I I ended up with a wonderful dog uh, that we have now, <laughs> uh, because uh, when I walked into an animal shelter, they had a two week trial period. And notice that's slightly different than the examples we've been talking about, right? A two week mm-hmm. trial period doesn't make it cheaper on the front end, but it does make it reversible. It makes you feel like worst case, right? If the thing doesn't work out, you can give it back, right? Now, of course, I didn't do that, and now Zoe is a wonderful dog who's lived in our house for uh, over eight years. But I was worried, look, I don't know if I'll be home enough. I don't know if I'll be good house for a dog. But that trial period made me feel like, look, worst case, if I'm uncomfortable, I can turn it around. Same with the money back guarantee, uh, for example. Uh, Same with lawyers that say, look, we only get paid uh, if you win. All these things make uh, reduce uncertainty by on the back end making you feel like you can you can make it reversible. And I'll give you just one even more example of this. Um, uh, I was talking about a car company, Acura, and they were saying, look, you know, part of the problem is uh, someone may like something, but if they don't know that thing exists, they're not going to try it. Right, so think about uh, people that are going to test drive an Acura. The only people that go to an Acura dealership to test drive an Acura are people who think they might like an Acura. If you don't think you'd like an Acura, you've never heard of the brand, you're never going to go take a test drive. And so what can you do to reach the set of people that might like what you're doing or offering but don't even know what you exist? And so uh, Acura did something quite interesting. They paired with W Hotels, which is a very high-end hotel chain, and they said, hey, look, anyone who's staying at a W Hotel can get a ride in an Acura for free. Uh, you want to go to the airport, you can get a free ride. You want to go to a client meeting, get a free ride. Anywhere you need to go, you don't need to pay anything, you don't need to fill out any information, you can get it for free in an Acura. And what that did is it said, hey, you know, you might be staying in a hotel, you might not know Acura exists, you might not like the brand, but if you need a ride, well, why not get it for free? Which is exactly what tens of thousands of people did. Did all of them buy the car in the end? No, not all of them did, but thousands did. Because what it did is it drove discovery. It brought the trial to people. Rather than people having to go figure out that trial themselves, it brought the trial to them, and because of that, it made them much more likely to buy. What role does someone's identity play in the process of them influencing or being influenced? Um, you know, I think that people want to be part of something bigger than themselves, right? Uh, those things are brand communities. Those things are political parties. Those things are being a fan of a, you know, a football team or um, a music uh, artist. And so we want to be sp- part of something bigger than uh, ourselves. And so, you know, a great way to get people to change is help them realize that other people like them are doing something, or the people that they don't want to be associated with are doing something. Uh, you know, you mentioned my other book, Invisible Influence. I talk about that a lot in the, in that book, right? You know, people look to others. They want to be part of the right groups and they want to avoid being part of the wrong groups. Uh, And so identity uh, can be an easy way to get people to change. I wonder what books have influenced your life? Uh, there's a book called Micro Motives and Macro Behaviors uh, that's all about sort of social influence and how we influence others who influence us and so on. A uh, famous book by Nobel Prize winner Thomas Schelling uh, that, I, that I like a lot. Um, there's a book called Made to Stick uh, by the Heath brothers. Uh, Chip Heath was one of my advisors in graduate school. Uh, I love that book as well. Uh, a book called The Tipping Point, many of your listeners are probably familiar with, uh, by Malcolm Gladwell, his first book. Um, uh, his other books are, are good, but I think that book is sort of a step above um, his other ones, a uh, really useful, uh, interesting book. Um, you know, all of those have had a, a significant impact uh, on, on me and sort of the way I see the world. Tremendous. If you could, based on this book, issue myself and our audience a, a challenge, if you will. Yeah, I think the first challenge or the main challenge I would issue uh, is, um, you know, you can change anything, but to change that thing, you have to figure out what the barriers are in the first place, right? I want to challenge us to be less blind to the barriers uh, that are, are Im- impeding uh, the action that we're hoping will take place. We tend to focus a lot on the change we want to have happen uh, and a lot less uh, on why someone hasn't changed already. Uh, and so that challenge is to try to start identifying the barriers, right? Anytime someone isn't doing what you want them to do or you want to get them to do something different, start by asking why haven't they done it already? Start by understanding what those barriers are, whether it's reactance, endowment, distance, uncertainty, corroborating evidence, any of the, you know, the five that I talk about in the book or another one. And I think once we begin to understand that, we'll, we'll be a lot more effective. 
let's imagine that uh, this coronavirus decides to bring humanity to an end and you are running out of time and you've only got five minutes left to live and it just conveniently happens to be on this podcast and based on your life lessons where you've learned you could share a short but impactful message that's not commercial based on your life what would you share (laughs) oh wow uh you know i think um uh i think i would say to always be curious um, I think that um, uh, there are always interesting things going on, uh, whether it's a person you're talking to or anything in the world can be interesting uh, if you look at it in a slightly different light. Uh, there's a podcast in the United States called This American Life, uh, and they always do a great job of kind of digging into the minutia of the world around us, and almost anything is interesting uh, if you if you really look at it the right way. Uh, and so I think you know we have a tendency to uh, gloss over things, um, but if we're always curious, if we're always sort of interested um, in what's going on around us, I think uh, we can really find value and, and meaning in almost anything. Where can our audience connect with you? And do you have any final wishes or requests or any parting messages? Yeah, sure. So uh, the best place to find me is uh, Jonah, J-O-N-A-H, uh, Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R dot com. Uh, the book is, uh, you find links to the book there. But I think most importantly, you'll find a bunch of free resources uh, about change, whether you want to change someone's mind, whether you want to change the boss's mind, uh, whether you want to change a client's behavior, uh, whether you want to change the world more generally. Uh, there's a bunch of free resources there that you can check out uh, and download and to learn more about the book. Uh, the book is available wherever books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, you know, Audible, whoever, wherever you prefer, uh, and people can find me uh, both on LinkedIn uh, as well as uh, on Twitter uh, at J1Burger. Jonah, this has been great. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show. It was a real pleasure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.